Brandon and his wife Carrie are lead pastors of Highlands Assembly of God in Highlands, Texas. Uh, they have two sons. Uh, Brandon was called to ministry at age 14, and the church he pastors now is his hometown family church, where he attended briefly as a child. Uh, Brandon majored in music education. I can relate to that. Brandon majored in music education at uh, Houston Baptist University, but left to pursue ministry vocationally in 2004. He was offered the opportunity to be the youth pastor and came back to Highlands in 2006 and, have, and has stayed there ever since. He became the lead pastor, the senior pastor of Highlands first in 2012 and then was ordained in 2013. I have asked him to share on how he, in his experience, has led a small church through transition. Uh, because God needs people everywhere. And uh, Brandon, he and I are friends. We get together frequently and yell at each other. And uh, it's all good. Let's give Brandon Brewer a hand. God bless you, buddy. I love you. <clears throat> Amen. Well, it's, it's an honor to be here uh, this morning. And I just want to... I want to encourage you uh, all, whether they're watching online or you're here in person, I, I sat where you sat. I had to go through Berean courses and I had to go through accelerated ministers training so I could meet requirements to become ordained and, and I gleaned a lot of wisdom and built relationships with some of these same pastors that you're hearing from today and, and you never know when God will bless you with an opportunity where you're in the place where you can pour into lives of ministers and training. You just never know where you're going to be. And I remember uh, when I was like in seventh grade, uh, Pastor Kevin, you were my Sunday school teacher at Channel View First Assembly. So we both come a long way. Uh, um, and, what, and, and Pastor Greg Thurstenson, he, he's been a dear friend for years. And, and that's kind of Greg's MO. Uh, he preached at my church, and he did the same thing. We took up an offering, and he gave the offering back to me, which was a real, which, just a real blessing. Um, just a little bit before we jump into how to uh, lead a small church through transition, um, I started pastoring my church in 2006 in my home. No, no, I went in 2006 as youth pastor. Started pastoring in 2012 in my hometown, uh, but I did not grow up in the church. I only went to the church for a few years as a child, left when I was like six years old, and we went to, to church in Channel View and stayed there for a lot of years, but had the opportunity to come back. And uh, there are still people in the community and still people in the church today that remember when I was a kid in the nursery at Highlands First Assembly. So it's, it's you never know, God, God can take you full circle and do things. He really can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or imagine. Amen. And I started pastoring the church uh, as a single guy, and then I got married in the middle of pastoring a church, so talk about transition. I'm learning how to pastor a church, doing youth ministry for a lot of years, and music ministry, and then I get married, and now I have to learn how to be a husband and be a dad, because it was instant family. We have two boys, and, uh, and, and also I have to pastor and learn how to pastor as a married man, and I think my wife had the biggest transition because she moved 3,000 miles away from Alaska to come back to Texas so she can marry a pastor. So can I just tell you, there's a, there's a little bit of tension in transition. There's tension in transition. But if you feel that tension, that may mean that God's about to transition you to something else that he has for you. So don't, don't be afraid of tension. Don't be afraid of transition. I'm not saying God is the author of the, of the tension. The enemy will try to cause tension to discourage you, but don't let him. And if, one more thing, if I can encourage you before we jump into the content this morning. Keep the main thing the main thing. Everything is about Jesus. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. We all know the story when Peter saw Jesus walking on the water with the other disciples. He said, call me out. And Peter stepped out of the boat. He was fine as long as he kept his focus on Jesus. Now, we give Peter a hard time because he took his eyes off Jesus, but he had the courage to step out of the boat to begin with. So think about that, right? Uh, but keep everything. This is, 
the, a lot of this content and, and what I'm teaching is like a lot of nuts and bolts business side of ministry because there is a business side to the church. And you just think, oh, well, I just want to preach. Well, there's a lot of business that goes into pastoring a church that's not preaching. And you have to learn how to work through that. But in everything, whether it's running a board meeting or a, a business meeting or writing a budget, it's we're, the reason we're here, the reason we're doing this is all about Jesus. So keep the main thing the main thing. Amen. Let's pray real quick. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness this morning. I thank you, God, for the, the, the awesome, blessed, anointed uh, sessions that we got to hear already as we were poured into today, God. And, and I just pray, Lord, that in these next few minutes that you will pour into us once again, Father God. Lord, may we receive what you have for us today, Father God, as we learn more about transition. And we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Father God, that we're here today so that we can learn to be good stewards of everything that you've given us. In the strong name of Jesus, and everyone said, amen. Okay, well, before we get into uh, the not fun stuff, because we are talking about church business, uh, let me say that there are aspects to pastoring a church, and if you're here this morning and you want to pastor a church because you love to preach, I want to pastor because I'll get to preach a lot. I had a guy ask me a couple of years ago, so what do you do? You just, you preach on, you go in and preach for 30 minutes on a Sunday and, and, and then you have the whole week off? I wish, <laughs> you know, no, no. Um, if you want to be a pastor because you love to preach, just know that preaching is only about 2% of what you'll do as a pastor. Okay, I'm not trying to stir, discourage you from pastoring, but just know, you, like Pastor Greg was talking about, your, your pastor may be in the valley all week, so cheer him on when he's on the mountaintop. Can I just tell you, us pastors need that? So encourage your pastor, love on your pastor, bless your pastor, uh, build relationships with uh, uh, other people in ministry uh, that will encourage you. Um, Pray for your pastor. Don't put your pastor up on a pedestal where he can be knocked off. Instead, put him on your prayer list where you can lift him up in prayer. Amen? Pastors need to be prayed for. And, and this isn't in my notes, but uh, we just got done with the se uh, sectional tour, and I went to five of ten, out of ten of those, hanging out with, uh, with Pastor Shane, uh, our men's director. And Pastor Tim talked about ministers getting discouraged and getting depressed. And I don't know if you heard, uh, but there was a pastor recently in California who the stress and pressure of doing life and ministry was so overwhelming that he decided to take his own life. Can I tell you, uh, men and women of God here this morning, never let ministry get to the point where it's overwhelming because it can be very overwhelming. Pastors hurt and have feelings too, but go to people like Pastor Kevin or Pastor Don or Pastor Greg uh, or whoever's in your circle and just say, hey, I need someone to listen to me. Or I just need someone to, to hug me. You know what I'm saying? You need that sometimes. So pastoring is, preaching is only about 2% of what you do. So this course is designed this morning, this session, of how to transition a small church into a place where it can do business on its own. We call that sovereign. You're going to hear that word a lot. Sovereign. A sovereign church. Uh, a church that can be independent, do business on its own, and uh, be able to... Uh, to grow uh, while doing good business. Uh, but, but let me say again, whether it's preaching, study, uh, praying, writing church budgets, or conducting a board meeting, God has called us to do everything with excellence. Um, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So shoot to please God in everything that you do. Uh, do everything with excellence. Maybe you desire to be more. Maybe you desire to have a, a, a bigger title, to work in a bigger church, whatever the case may be. Maybe you love uh, working with kids, but you think you want to step up and be a youth pastor because to you that's a different plateau. Um, or maybe you love working with young people, but you think you want to be a senior pastor and you keep getting overlooked. I've been in those places where I thought I was overlooked. My, my church that I pastor now went through two pastoral changes while I was there, 
And both times I thought, I'm already here. I'm supposed to be the pastor. But God knows what he's doing. God knows what he's doing. Let me just tell you uh, to bloom where you're planted in the season that you're in. Until God moves you to the next season, serve your pastor. Serve that church. No matter how mundane or simple the task may be, uh, desire above all to do everything with excellence, serving God and bringing glory to him. Amen? Uh, One of my very first ministry assignments before ministry became uh, vocational was to open the gym for kids getting off the bus ministry in Channel View and setting up chairs for the youth service. I got there early and I made sure every chair was in a straight line. And if kids threw a basketball and knocked the chairs out of order, I yelled at them kids and I straightened the chairs back up again. That was my ministry. I was the the chair setter upper guy. I I don't know if that's a title in the Assemblies of God or not, but well we okay, sounds good. We'll make one. But but do it wholeheartedly. And I believe because I did that wholeheartedly. Ultimately, because I did that well, God promoted me to where I am today. Um, So Zechariah 4, verse 10 says, To not despise small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Amen? And just on a side note, making the PowerPoint for this, this thing this week, I haven't done PowerPoint since I was a youth pastor. Thankfully, it hadn't changed a lot in the last 10 or 12 years. So. <laughs> okay, so now let's get to the... Uh, let, let me also say that don't despise taking a small church just because you think, oh, well, I, I've served on staff with larger churches or I want to be in a big city. Or uh, you know, I mean, your Pastor Kevin said he's a, a city guy, but he took a church in a rural community. But look at the impact they've had. And to grow after every disaster only God can do that so don't despise going to a small town taking a small church don't 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 balk at that those small communities and those small churches they need pastors too they need pastors too they need someone to pastor them and that person may be you that was the case with my church had I not taken the church when the opportunity came that church probably would have closed its doors I'm just being real. But I said, no, I, I, no, these people here, they need a place to come worship on Sundays. And even though the church was small, uh, even the smallest church, I mean, every situation is unique, but even the smallest church, if it closes, can have devastating impact in a community. Uh, just this morning before we uh, started, I, I got a, a Facebook message, and um, Someone was asking, hey, can, can we have church tomorrow night? I know sometimes we do evening stuff. I've got to work tomorrow, but I just need a little bit of church. And this isn't someone that doesn't come to our church very often. but they, So you never know. You pastor people whether they sit in your pews on Sunday morning or not. Those small communities need pastors. Those small churches need pastors. So if there's a small church or a developing church or even a church that's struggling to the brink of closing, prayerfully consider, Lord, is that where you're calling me? Prayerfully consider that because that community needs a pastor in it and that pastor may be you, my friends, right? Okay, now let's get to the business aspect of of today's course, the, the leading a small church through transition. At first, my church was governed by an outside board, the sectional presbytery committee, and we called, and I had to fill out a report every month, and we called it a a report for what's called a dependent assembly, and so I had an outside board that helped oversee and govern my church, and I was uh, appointed as pastor, Uh, but my desire from the get-go was to get our church to a place where we could be sovereign or autonomous, we'll use that word, to where we could do good business on our own, have our own church board. Um, so now I want to talk about how the, what the nuts and bolts are to getting there. And Pastor Don was with me through that whole, whole process. Uh, if I needed to call someone and ask questions, I would blow up his phone and, and he would always answer. So 
we would. I mean, because, you know, God calls you to suffer, right? Sometimes. You know. So, let me say that if you pastor a church that's in a situation like that, whether it be a new church or a struggling church or a church that had some issues and they don't have their own church board, a church needs to be at a place where it can do good business. A church needs to be at a place where it can be sovereign and do its own business without the need for an outside board. Not, not talking bad about my, the, the presbytery committee of our section. I love those guys. I still go talk to my presbyter. Just this week I went and hung out with him just, just because. Just because it's good to be fed and iron sharpens iron, right? But some pastors don't want a church board for fear that the church board might try to control what they can do in the ministry. We call that um, deacon possession, I think is the term that's had a negative connotation in churches. But it, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. There's no need for it to be that way. Um, uh, are they afraid that maybe they'll try to control the church or maybe that board will stifle growth because they're not supporting the pastor's vision or whatever? But let me tell you, there are great churches both large and small, with excellent pastor-board relationships that do great business. And if a church does great business already, but is not sovereign, if it's already doing great business on its own, and there's people that can form a board in that church, and that pastor can lead them, they need to do business on their own. It's a good thing. It's a milestone. It's a transition that needs to be made, I believe, so God can take you to the next level. At least that's how I, that's what I feel for my church, anyway. So, when becoming a pastor, looking at taking a small church, here are some different classifications of churches within the Assemblies of God, within our district specifically, that you may need to know. Uh, one term is called a PAC, a PAC, or a Parent Affiliated Church. This church is a church that's mothered or parented by a larger, more established church. Uh, the established church is the board for the, for the church it's mothering, for the church that it's Almost like that church would be a second campus, kind of, because that church's board assumes responsibility for the business of that second church. But there are a lot of great churches that started this way. Uh, I've, Access Church in Pearland, Jeremy Murphy's church, it started as a, a pack, and now they do great business on their own. Uh, so, but uh, there's a lot of churches that have started out with a mother church type situation, a parent church, and now they do their own business and they, they, they have their own church board. So if you know a church is a packed church, don't be afraid of that. But go in with, hopefully, with the goal of taking it out of that if that's the vision of the church that mothers it. Sometimes churches don't want to do that. But The next one is called a district affiliated new work. And this is um, a term that used, is used to identify churches that are kind of in a formative state. They're in a formative state, uh, maybe as a, a result of a church plant or an evangelistic work, but they haven't come into the position where they can be self-governing, so they need some assistance by the outside board, by uh, what we used to call a dependent assembly. And the sectional presbytery board would serve as that church's board until the church was able to become sovereign. And that was the case for my church for a few years. And now we have a new classification in our district that's called District Affiliated Sovereign. This is a church that does great business on its own, but may still be under the minimum membership requirements required by general counsel uh, to be a sovereign church. But the church does great business, and uh, they have their own board, but they don't quite reach the minimum number of voting members, uh, which is 20, for a general counsel to say, we recognize that assembly as a sovereign church. So our district said, uh, well, let's come up with a classification for these smaller churches that do great business, but they're not quite to that number. And so we call that a district-affiliated sovereign church. And, um, and if you're in a district-affiliated type situation where it's a new work, if you're not large enough to be a general counsel-affiliated church, which all a general council affiliated church is, is a church that's 20 or more voting members that does business on its own. You want to be sovereign either in one of those two scenarios, district affiliated sovereign or general council affiliated, because something could happen with another district affiliated church 
like say you pastor in Winnie and something happens in Victoria and all of a sudden your church is liable legally for what happened in Victoria because they all come under that district affiliated dependent assembly new work umbrella so if you're sovereign and you have your own board legally you're protected and you don't have to I mean, gosh, I mean, I just, I mean, think of the example. If something happened and there was a lawsuit that the district had to fight, potentially all those affiliated churches' properties could be sold, and all of a sudden those churches have nowhere to go because one church had some legal entanglement that the district and Pastor Don's office had to get involved in. So that's why churches need to be sovereign. That's why churches need to be sovereign. So what do you need to become a sovereign church? Well, there's some documents you need. There's always paperwork, right? Paperwork is fun. Well, just like our nation has the Constitution that, and we have the Bill of Rights, we have those things that govern us as a nation, well, your church is going to have governing documents, and those are called Constitution and Bylaws. Uh, they're your church governing document. They explain who you are has your church corporate name, the purpose of the church, how you govern, how you function, the purpose of the church. Uh, it defines what the tenets of faith are, and if you're an Assembly of God church, your Constitution and bylaws better have the 16 fundamental truths as your church doctrine. Those are the non-negotiable things. Those 16 fundamental truths, those are the doctrine for your church. In fact, our Constitution and bylaws, it's only 18 pages. The first, like, 12 pages is just 16 fundamental truths <laughs> because that's, and so, but then there's, but then when it comes to board elections and stuff like that and membership requirements, you can have some leeway there, but 16 fundamentals, that's non-negotiable if you're going to associate with the Assemblies of God, right? So, uh, and it'll talk about how to conduct business, how to elect officers, elect board members, elect deacons, how to hire a pastor, what are the duties of the elected officers or board members, and what are the qualifications of membership? How do you discipline a church member? How do you discipline a board member? Those things are usually in your Constitution and bylaws. Uh, and it also will talk about we have an annual business meeting and, uh, and when to meet and maybe even has a little bit of a template inside the bylaws about what will be discussed in the business meeting. And if you pastor a church or you're pastoring a church and you don't have a constitution and bylaws, uh, email me. My email is on the first slide, I think. Email me. I will be glad to shoot you a copy of mine. And you can just copy and paste it and change the church name. No, don't do that. But just as a template, and I believe we have some on the district website too, right? We have some templates for Constitution and bylaws. So um, it doesn't have to be difficult. It doesn't have to be difficult. And, and I've looked at other churches' bylaws. I'll ask a pastor, hey, can I see your bylaws? Let me just, you know, just to get an idea. Because there's a lot of different ways to do business and do business well. And you need the bylaws in order to do that. Um, okay, the next thing you need are articles of incorporation. These documents are very important because they establish the existence of your church as a corporation in the United States. And because there is a business side to the church, so yes, you're a church, but like our church, we're Highlands Assembly, but we're also the First Assembly of God Church of Highlands, Texas, Incorporated, because we do business. Um, we're a 501c3 nonprofit religious institution, but you have to have incorporation documents. And those documents, uh, you can apply for those with the Secretary of State in the state of Texas. And then once they're applied for, they have to be filed with the Secretary of State. And in very general terms, those documents state your corporate name of the church and the purpose for why the church exists without giving you a whole bunch of details. And a lot of churches that may be in those formative states May have established a constant, may have established articles of incorporation years ago. That was the case for my church, so thankfully we didn't have to apply for new ones. I already had them, I just had to dig them out. So, but, but anyway, but you can apply with the Secretary of State, and corporations do it all the time. Okay, so the next thing you need aren't documents, but you got to have people to do good business. So, you need to have a board, a church board, you need to have board members. 
a board of directors, whatever you want to call that, board of trustees. And the process uh, for nominating and electing board members or deacons should be outlined in your constitution and bylaws. And it usually varies by church. Uh, I'll give you an example. I'll give you two examples. No, I'll give you three examples. The church I grew up in, uh, nominations were taken from the floor in a board meeting, and it could, remember Pastor Kevin at Channel View First Assembly, it, the business meeting might go on forever with just, we want this guy to be a board member. We want, and then elections would come. We don't have an election, and then we go. So <laughs> that's one way. That is not the way I recommend, okay? Uh, but that's one way. You can nominate, and if there's a certain percentage or quorum of, of members that say, yes, we want Bob Smith to be the board member, well, praise God, you got one. But, um, but see, that that really doesn't allow for vetting of the board member. They might be nominating someone just because they're their friends or because they're popular and they may not be qualified to serve. Uh, I'll give you another example. Our church, we, either the pastor or the board, nominates board members and brings them before the church so the church can vote. But, if the, but that allows me as the pastor and the board to consider those people, to pray about those people, to vet them, and so we vet them, and then we bring them to the church. So the church still has a voice, they still have a vote, but as the pastor, I may know a little more about their spiritual condition than someone that just comes to church on Sundays. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I know another church that uh, they're in the process of changing their bylaws to allow it this way. Again, it's a different way. Uh, but it, but it accomplishes the same thing that, that ours does. Uh, they are going to have a nomination box and allow church members to nominate board members, and then those nominations will be taken by the pastor and the church board to be considered and prayed over, and then the board confirms after vetting those three or four or however many members, and then they presented to the church as, based on your nominations, we prayed about, we vetted, and we voted as a board, here are your new church board members. D different way to do it, uh, but it allows for the pastor and the board to vet, so you know if, if they're qualified to serve and the qualifications for service would be in your constitution and bylaws. Um, but I, let me say this, when choosing a board, when wanting to become sovereign and when choosing a board for the first time, pray. Pray about who God would want to sit under you as the pastor that would help support your vision. Who would not only support you as the pastor, but also have the best interests of the church at heart. Amen. Uh, and in fact, uh, my constitution and bylaws allows it, there may be enough people to serve on the board in our church, but it's worded in such a way whether instead of saying qualified members, it's qualified individuals so that we can allow someone on the outside of the church that meets qualifications to serve. And actually I have a pastor of another church serving on my board because he can provide some awesome insight to taking a small third church to, through transition and stuff that he's worked out with his board. And so I get to benefit and learn along the way. So uh, the, the board, you want anointed, godly people that can be trusted to serve on your board, whether it be men or women. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. Um, don't be afraid. Traditionally, it's always men. But don't be afraid to... Women, we love you too. You can serve on boards too, amen? Okay? Let me just say that because I'm married to a woman and she might be watching this on live stream. And Anyway. Pray. Pray about who to consider. Let the Holy Spirit lead you in that process. And then you want anointed people that not only supports your vision as the pastor, but um, have the best interest of the church at heart that you can really trust with things, with confidential things, business-wise in the church, that makes it much easier for you to focus on ministry and that you know that you could trust them with certain business duties in the church. And then another thing you need real quick is once a year you need to have an annual business meeting. And business meetings can be not fun and be lengthy and be very frustrating, but they don't have to be. The meeting 
uh, allows church business to be discussed. Read the financial statement from the prior year. Here's where we are financially. Here's what we average in the bank. Stuff like that. Uh, but I would say just as a general template for a, a, a church business meeting, keep the main thing the main thing. You're there to focus on Jesus, right? So open that business meeting with praise and worship. Let's have some praise and worship, and then let's have a devotion. You know, just a short 10, 15-minute devotion and allow you our invites. So in fact, we had one recently, and Pastor Don, he came and did the devotion for us. Invite someone to come lead the devotion. And then, after that, then get to the business stuff. But remind your church in a business meeting, after praise and worship, after the devotion, we're here because we want to reach this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So everything is about Jesus, amen? Everything is about Jesus. So after you read the financial statements and maybe elect officers if elections need to take place, um, then let that business meeting be a place where you as the pastor can cast vision for the church for the next year. And Sometimes you may say, well, can there be a, a business meeting outside of that once a year business meeting? Yeah, and there's usually guidelines for calling a business meeting that's special called outside of your annual business meeting. And, uh, and I don't know if you've ever sat in a business meeting, but just, just for, because I said this is a nuts and bolts type uh, presentation. Uh, if once, like let's say a financial statement is read, someone needs to make a motion to accept those financial statements read and then someone needs to second that all in favor aye all opposed uh, so those things have to happen but again if you keep your eyes on jesus and make everything about him you should have smooth business meetings they don't need to be frowned upon or not looked forward to you can look forward to those things um and even before I was a, we were a sovereign church, um, I would always draw up a financial statement just in the entrance of transparency. I would let the church once a year know, here's where we are. Here's what we have in the bank. We spent a little more this year than what we had in offerings. Or, hey, we got more this year in then what we spent. Praise God. Those are always good days, but there's always that ebb and flow in business. Uh, just so the church people felt like they really knew. And then if anyone ever has a question, they can always come ask me, and I can answer those questions. As long as that question isn't something confidential, like how much does sister so-and-so tithe every month? I'm not giving you that information. But if you want to know how much our budget is every month and how much we need in offerings and how much we've spent so far, I'll give you that info. You know what I'm saying? So but there's confidential information that you got to be careful with. That's why you want to have trusted board members, et cetera. And another thing about an annual business meeting, make sure you have someone, usually the church secretary or the board secretary, record minutes. Just a detailed ledger of the meeting opened in prayer, praise and worship, Pastor Brandon gave a devotion, the financial statement was read, a motion was made to accept it by Sister Smith, seconded by Brother Johnson, you know, stuff like that. And then the, uh, uh, a motion was made to adjourn the meeting, it was seconded, and we closed, something like that. Because sometimes that may be all there is in a meeting. There may not be elections of board members or whatever. And, and hopefully, anyway, in my church, that there's never going to be elections for pastor, because hopefully they like the job that I'm doing. And they want to keep me around a while. Uh, but anyway, and just one last thing, and then I'll, I'll let you uh, ask some questions uh, if you have any. Uh, but if not, we can get to lunch a little early maybe. Um, insurance. I just sent her uh, an application off this week. There's uh, a type of insurance called board and officer's insurance or board and director's insurance. I'm waiting on my insurance guy to get back with me now. But it's not that expensive, but you want that for legal coverage just in case there's ever an accusation like sexual misconduct. Because unfortunately, those accusations and things do happen in churches, right? You want the church to be protected. You want 
you as the pastor to be protected and the board to be protected legally, have legal representation available through that insurance, et cetera. Um, articles of incorporation provide some protection, but so uh, you need that insurance. And it may be that I talk to my insurance guy and he goes, Pastor, there probably will be nothing that happens at your church that will warrant you ever needing to use this, but you should have it just in case. So I would rather have it and never use it than need it and not have it. Same thing with like, you know, car insurance. If you don't have liability insurance in the state of Texas and you get in a car wreck that you caused, you're in trouble, right? Health insurance. I would like to be able to have it to go to the doctor, but I don't want to go to the doctor if I don't need to, right? So, uh, and then of course there's other things, church liability insurance, uh, fire insurance, theft insurance, things like that. But, uh, we won't talk about all that. But before I uh, answer questions, though, uh, let me just say this. You can search for me on Facebook. Just type in my name. I saw Pastor Greg. He put his Facebook and Instagram handle. Uh, you can find me on Facebook. I will, I will accept your friend request. Send me a message. Uh, if you ever have a question, email me. I'll be glad to answer those questions. And then, I, uh, of course, we have great resources within the district office, too. Pastor Don is always available. And people in his office and so build relationships don't be afraid if you don't know something ask questions there's always this intimidation I think where oh I don't know I don't know well if you don't know ask someone amen if you don't know ask anyway that's I think that covers it